In our last video, we took a look at a way to approximate the area under a curve. Today, we're going to attempt to answer the question, how do we find the exact area under a curve? No more estimating. We want an exact area. And the answer to this is going to be what we're going to call the definite integral. And the idea of the definite integral is we're trying to find the area under some function f of x from a point A to a point B. And the way the definite integral is defined comes from that area formula we were using in our previous section. In the previous section, we said that the area was equal to the sum as i goes from 1 to some number of rectangles in of each of the heights, f of xi, times the delta x. And what we discussed was that as we do more and more rectangles, the more and more exact this definition becomes for the area. So in theory, if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, and we have an infinite number of rectangles, there should be no more error. And that's going to give us the exact area. And we will represent this exact area with what's called the integral, which is kind of a stretched out s from a to b, from the lowest point to the highest point, of the function dx. So let's take a look at how we can use this definition to find an exact area or an exact definite integral. Let's take the integral from 0 to 2 of 3x squared dx. And we're going to keep in mind this formula that the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of x sub i delta x is going to equal that integral. Let's break down the pieces of this. First, let's look at the delta x. That delta x, we know from our work on the previous lesson, is the high minus the low divided by the number of rectangles. Or in this case, 2 minus 0 divided by the number of rectangles, which we're going to eventually take to infinity. So delta x is 2 over n. That's the delta x piece, 2 over n. The x sub i piece, x sub i, the way we calculate uh, that value of the x value, we start at the initial x point. Let's say we're doing left boxes. And we add some number of delta x's. And that's that i that counts up. So if i is 1 half, we move over 1 half, and then 2 halves, and then 3 halves, and then 4 halves. What's nice here is that the left endpoint of x is starting at 0. So really, this is just i times delta x. But we know what delta x is. Delta x is 2 over n. So that's really i times 2 over n or we like to put the number in front, 2i over n. That is our x sub i value, 2i over n. Going out then, let's see if we can figure out what f of x sub i is. f of x sub i, remember x sub i is 2i over n. And the function we're talking about is 3x squared. So we have 3 times our 2i over n squared. Well, 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12i squared over n squared when we simplify. So the f of xi is equal to 12i squared over n. 
Let's then take this to the next step. Don't worry about the limit yet. We're just going to see if we can calculate the sum of all the pieces. The sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of x sub i, we just found out in purple, that's 12i squared over n squared times our delta x. Well, our delta x, we said, was 2 over n. So now if I simplify this a bit, I get the sum as i goes from 1 to n of 24i squared over n cubed. And technically, 24 and the n cubed are constants, because only the i is changing. So I can pull those out. 24 over n cubed times the sum as i goes from 1 to n. And we have a formula for the sum of i squared. So if we have that 24 over n cubed, the i squared formula is the top number n times n plus 1 times 2n minus 1. I'm sorry, 2n plus 1 all over 6. We can do a little simplifying here. 24 over 6 is 4. n over n cubed is n squared. So now we've got 4 times. If I FOIL this out, I have 2n squared plus 3n plus 1 over all that's left is n squared. And if I distribute the, n, the 4 through, we end up with 8n squared plus 12n plus 4 over n squared. But we've missed one piece of our formula, the limit as n goes to infinity. So let me see if I can buy myself a little bit of space. The limit as n goes to infinity of that 8n squared plus 12n plus 4 over the n squared. We know from our previous quarter of calculus that the largest exponents take over. It really becomes 8n squared over n squared, which reduces to just 8, which means the integral that we started with from 0 to 2 of 3x squared dx. The area underneath 3x squared between 0 and 2 is equal to 8 square units. Now, that was quite an involved process. We try and avoid this process as much as possible. Sometimes geometry is easier. For example, if I wanted to find the integral from negative 2 to 6 of the square root of 16 minus x minus 2 squared dx, it would be quite ugly to go through that entire process. But if we were to graph this function, clear out the old function, we want the square root of 16 minus x minus 2, close the parentheses, squared. And I'm going to hit z squared, which is number 5, so it's to scale. What we end up with is this semicircle. This semicircle that's kind of centered at 0, 2, and it's got a radius of 4 each direction. Let's go ahead and draw that. So it was centered at 0, 2. Radius was 4. So it has a height of 4. And it was this semicircle going through the points. We want the area from negative 2 to 6, which happens to be this entire semicircle under that curve. 
Well, rather than going through that process we just did up above, let's just know that the formula for the area of a circle is pi r squared. And since this is a semicircle, we'll divide that by 2. We said the radius here was 4 units. So we've got pi times 4 squared over 2, which is equal to 8 pi. 8 pi is our area. Or if you like a decimal, it's about 25.13. So sometimes knowing some of these geometry formulas are going to make life a lot easier for us, and we don't have to go through that whole process. For example, if I want the integral from 1 to 3 of 4 minus x dx, we know 4 minus x has a y-intercept of 4 and a slope of down 1 over 1. So we end up with this type of shape going on. But we want the area between 1 and 3. We want the area underneath that blue line in green there. Well, we know that's a trapezoid. The trapezoid's tipped sideways. But if you remember, the area for a trapezoid is 1 half times the first base plus the second base. And remember, the bases are the parallel parts, not the bottom and top, the parallel parts, times the height. Well, if we count, the first base is 1, 2, 3 tall. The second base is 1 tall. And the height that connects them is 2 long. So for our area, it's 1 half times the first base of 3 plus the second base of 1 times the height of 2. And when we calculate that out, we end up with an area of 4 units. So geometry does make finding some of these areas a lot easier. Another thing that we can use to help us is we can use, we'll call this part B, we can use the properties of definite integrals. And these properties really come from the summation formula, the definition. So let's look at the properties. You're going to see these properties are very similar to the sigma properties we saw in our previous lesson. Our first property is quite simple. If we take the integral from any point to itself of f of x dx, because there's no, there's no width here, we're just going from any point to itself, back to itself, no width. We end up with the width of 0 times any height. That's just going to be 0. That property is almost too boring to even talk about. A more interesting property, though, would be if I take the integral from a to b of f of x dx, and I find it easier to switch the order of integration and instead integrate from b to a of f of x dx. It turns out that that is the opposite. So if we switch the integration, we just end up with a negative out front. Also, the integral from a to b of f of x either plus or minus some other function g of x dx just like we can take the sigma through addition and subtraction, we can take the integral through as well. And we have the integral from a to b of f of x dx, either plus or minus the integral from a to b of g of x dx. Our fourth property, if we have the integral from a to b of some constant times a function, just like we had before with summations, if there was a constant, we could pull the constant out of the summation. We can pull this constant out as well. And we have the integral from a to b of f of x dx, which might be easier to evaluate. One last property to talk about today. If we have the integral from a to b of f of x dx, we can actually split it into multiple parts. 
let's say the number c is somewhere between a and b. We can take the integral from a to c of f of x dx and add to it the integral from c to b of f of x dx. Similar to how we did the sums, if we want to get rid of the bottom part, we could subtract off the bottom part or whatever piece we're looking for. So these five properties will help us also evaluate several definite integrals. Let's take a look at practicing a few of these with some examples. The first example, I'm going to tell you that the integral from 1 to 4 of some function f of x dx is equal to 3. And the integral from 1 to 4 of some function g of x dx is equal to negative 1. And we need to find the integral from 1 to 4 of 3 times f of x minus 2 times g of x dx. Well, we know from our properties we can take the integral through the addition and subtraction. And we also know that the constants of 3 and 2 can move out front. So what we really have is 3 times the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x minus 2 dx minus 2 times the integral of from 1 to 4 of g of x dx. And then we can substitute what we know. We know f of x dx is equal to 3. And we know the g of x dx is equal to negative 1. So plugging that in, we have 3 times the f of x integral, which is 3, minus 2 times the g of x integral, which we know is negative 1. Gives us 9 plus 2, which is 11. We can even do this, uh, use these properties more specifically with maybe a function we know. Let's say the integral from 1 to 3 of e to the x dx. I found this for you. It's approximately, not exactly, but approximately 17.4. And I also calculated the integral from 1 to 2 of e to the x dx. It's approximately equal to 4.7. And we're going to find the integral from 2 to 3 of 4 e to the x dx. Well, one problem we have here is we're taking the integral from 2 to 3. We know 1 to 3, and we know 1 to 2. We want what's in between those, the 2 to 3. So what we can do is we can break this up and say we want the integral from 1 to 3, the whole thing, of 4 e to the x dx, and subtract off the integral that we don't want, the 1 to 2 stuff of 4 e to the x dx. What we can also do, though, is we can pull those constants out front. So we really have 4 times the integral of 1 to 3 of e to the x dx minus 4 times the integral from 1 to 2 of e to the x dx. And now we can plug what we know in. 1 to 3? That's 17.4. Minus 4, 1 to 2, that's 4.7. And now all we have to do is plug that into our calculator. And we'll get 50.8. The integral from 2 to 3 of 4 e to the x dx is 50.8. One last thing, then, that I want to talk about along with this line of finding exact values of integration. I want to talk about finding what's called the average value of a function. In other words, what's the average height this function has 
over a range. Let's say that we want the average value of f of x between the points a to b. Well, the reason we talk about this here is the formula falls right in line with finding areas. We'll say the average f value is equal to 1 over b minus a, or dividing by the width, times the integral from a to b of that function f of x dx. So if I wanted to find the average value or the average height of f of x equals 6 minus 2x on the interval from 0 to 3, what we're really saying is the average is equal to, using our formula, 1 over b minus a, 3 minus 0, of the integral from 0 to 3 of 6 minus 2x dx. So all I really need to do is figure out what is the integral from 0 to 3 of 6 minus 2x dx. Let's use geometry. Six minus two x dx, we know that has a y-intercept of six and a slope of minus two over one, minus two over one, minus two over one, and we end up with this nice little triangle. We want to go from zero to three to get that area underneath. Well, the area of a triangle is 1 half times the base times the height. So 1 half times our base. Our base is 3. And the height of this rectangle or triangle is 6. So 1 half of 3 times 6 is 9. So to calculate our average, we get 1 over 3 minus 0 is 3 times the integral or the area under 0 and through 3, we just found out that area is 9. And 1 third of 9 is 3. That means the average height of this function is 3 units high. We could even, if we want to know when that occurs, when does the average occur? What we're really saying is we want to know f of c, what value of c allows it to equal that average height of 3? Well, f of c, that would be 6 minus 2c equals 3. And this becomes a real easy algebra problem for us to solve. We'll subtract the 6 to get negative 3 and divide by negative 3. I'm sorry, divide by negative 2, and we get a positive 3 halves. And so what we'll find is at 3 halves, this function hits the average height of 3. So the average value, not really difficult to calculate, but it does give us another context in which to practice finding these exact values of area under a curve. So take a look at the homework assignment today. Practice a few of these. And in class, we'll discuss it further and answer any questions that you might have.